Air monitoring in Wood Buffalo is perhaps the, the most extensive of any region or airshed in Alberta. Uh, the types of air monitoring that, uh, that, that uh, are being done is very much state of the art. Ambient air is drawn through this glass manifold and passed onto the back of this continuous analyzer. This analyzers monitor for specific parameters. This analyzers are scanned five times a minute with this data logger. This data logger then transfers the data to a hub in Edmonton. And through a hub in Edmonton, it transfers the data to our website for data that is available or monitored in Wood Buffalo in real time. Exposure is the key link between pollutants and health effects. The time spent inside your home, uh, perhaps your, your, what you do at work, are very, very strong determinants of exposure to air pollutants. The emissions from industry uh, play a very small role. The findings uh, uh, clearly show that air quality in the Wood Buffalo region uh, has not changed very much over the past 10 years. There is a belief that uh, the environment is being affected. And from my point of view, there is also a belief that people could be being exposed out there one can make a link between what's happening in terms of what's being released into the environment and what you're observing in the environment. Alberta Environment works closely with industrial players across the province and also environmental associations, but we are a regulator and we do have the authority to take enforcement actions when necessary. Although the trends indicate good air quality, uh, odor episodes do occur. So the source of the odor could be uh, something that's uh, natural. It could be like forest fires, or it could be uh, decaying vegetation. It could be related to industrial activities. It also could be related to vehicle emissions. The Burn Environment employs about 90 field staff across the province to ensure that the rules are being followed. Processes that are used in monitoring air quality can be in stationary locations or they can actually be in mobile locations where we can actually move a vehicle around to different areas, uh, track the odor if wind changes are occurring or uh, different times of the day or different uh, seasons of the year. If we looked at the region in North America with the poorest air quality, uh, that's the Houston-Galveston region and it's, uh, much, it's the largest industrialized area in, uh, in North America. So if we consider the types of air quality that the concentrations they have there and we wanted to say where is a region that has better air quality, well let's uh, talk about the city of Toronto. So uh, not quite as industrialized, however largely populated. And if we want to go to talk about well where is air quality even better, then we can go to the city of Edmonton. Uh, it's a much smaller populated uh, area and uh, uh, overall much less emissions, better air quality. And then finally, uh, let's talk about uh, Fort Mackay in the Wood Buffalo region and even many aspects Fort McMurray. Air quality is even better there. Changes in the environment tend to occur very slow. They, they are very subtle and one would expect that it would take uh, at least several decades before you can see changes that are very strong in their signal. I think it would be very important to, to acknowledge that the majority of emissions coming from these development activities are from surface related activities. So uh, in situ activities have much smaller emissions and we would expect to see perhaps even smaller changes in air quality that we have observed over the past 10 years. I work for Alberta Environment and the government of Alberta has a very extensive monitoring program in this region. We have 11 sites strategically located that continuously monitor contaminants uh, in the Athabasca River and its tributaries. These ones here that you see collect a variety of different uh, metals from uh, mercury to arsenic uh, to the broad suite. One of the contaminants that's of primary concern are naphthenic acids. 
uh, very specific to bitumen deposits and process affected waters and these are these are cutting edge leading edge technology for identifying those concentrations in surface waters and we get the full range through a day through a week through a month through the entire year what the pattern of, of natural contaminant loading is and any uh, additional contaminant loading that may be occurring from industry the mines are just right nearby here break this stuff off like this this is what they're after when they mine. This is oil sand and you can push your finger right into it as I'm doing here. It is very soft and it flows on a warm day into the river. And if you look over here you can see the impacts of this natural loading. You can see the oil on top of the water from the river basically in contact with the oil sands formation that comprises the banks of this river. The industry component of monitoring is a legal requirement as part of their approval conditions and of course the companies have to take it very very seriously because being out of compliance carries very stiff penalties. Companies implement groundwater monitoring, surface water monitoring and air monitoring as well as other metrics used to describe impacts to the landscape. All of Tailings Ponds have some amount of seepage. That seepage is very slow and very low, however, it does occur. And so around those Tailings Ponds, we need to understand exactly what the seepages are and what those seepage rates are. And we have to make sure that the seepage collection systems that they put in are effective. If there were to be a spill or uh, some kind of upset that uh, put more naphthenic acids into the system, we would detect it on these and we would be able to determine that that had occurred. Fortunately, our results have shown that, uh, that there have been no uh, incidences in these systems and that uh, we're getting mostly background loading uh, from natural sources. Biodiversity is a catch-all term for really the state of uh, all the living resources uh, that we have in the world. The Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, ABMI, is one of the biggest programs in the world for monitoring diversity. We cover all of Alberta, not just sections of it. Being a not-for-profit society uh, in the business of collecting this information, we are not a management agency. Our job is to collect credible information on biodiversity in the province, supply that to government, industry, to actually help them make decisions about managing the resources that are of interest, including the oil sands area. It's the intactness of the forest as a wildlife biologist that I spend most of my time concerned about. I comment to a variety of groups as a local technical expert on state of these populations and trends, uh, habitat concerns that affect those populations, and try and add as much information to the planning process as I'm able to. Our biodiversity index ranges between zero and a hundred and a parking lot like this in downtown Edmonton would have a value of zero biodiversity. Whereas if you move into the oil sands region and include the mine sites plus the forest area around it, you actually get values on the order of 95 or greater. So there's a lot of biodiversity still in that region. Hey Tracy, I think what we saw out there was just all gulls, young and young of the year plus this year's. It tells us that the biodiversity is still in very good shape and that's partly because uh, the actual human footprint that we've created in that region is still at a young stage. The challenge will be making a decision as to what our target should be for biodiversity in that region and then managing our activities to try and achieve that target. If we develop everywhere all at once then we're going to suffer on the biodiversity side. If we are careful in our reclamation strategies and focus on areas while leaving other areas intact, allow those areas of reclamation to take hold, then we can potentially move forward in a more paced over time and space approach to industrial development and still have a chance to maintain the bulk of the biodiversity that we have here. The ABMI information we hope will become the, the benchmark for assessing how we will change over time in Alberta to try and maintain levels of diversity that society, governments and industries want to achieve.
This used to be a tailings pond. If you were here two years ago, you wouldn't be able to drive across it. So we've been reclaiming this pond for the past four years. So far we've planted 150,000 trees. It's probably about this big when it was planted, so it's grown quite a bit. Uh, we have 450,000 more to go. Just over this hill here was actually a big hole in the ground. It was one of the first mine pits that we had at Syncrude. The trees are 15 to 20 years old that were reclaimed that long ago. And then there's other areas where it's uh, quite a bit younger. Some of the trees down there are between five and 10 years old. Reclamation is a pretty complex activity actually. It starts with detailed planning uh, from before a project even gets started and it goes all the way through mining and operations um, through to closure. All the operators have a requirement to reclaim everything that they actually disturb for mining. So whether it's a mine pit or a tailings pond or um, an overburdened disposal area. Our goal up here in the oil sands is to make the landform sustainable and the drainage is functioning and appropriate and last a long time. My experience yeah. in the oil sands is learning better ways to do things. Ten years ago when we were doing consultation with First Nations elders, they told us if we took that forest floor layer and put it in an area that was ready for reclamation, then, then it would um, speed up our reclamation process. One day, this will look like a really nice wetland with some rolling upland hills. Woody debris provides uh, wildlife habitat and provides some opportunities for biodiversity in the area. Here is an example of soil placement. So this is actually on top of tailing sand and then there's some natural sand. You can see the red stuff and then here's your reclamation material, upland surface soil. So it gives a good foundation for trees and shrubs to grow in. After the trees and shrubs are planted then companies actually monitor the land for a number of years. There's monitoring related to soils, uh, trees, other understory vegetation, water quality, wildlife. After a period of monitoring, we would look at reclamation certification. So by certifying an entire landform, we can ensure that the drainage and the vegetation is integrated with the surrounding landscape. This is probably one of the oldest uh, areas of reclamation at Suncor. There's strawberries, raspberries, a lot of um, species that are native to the region. Just to see how much the trees have grown and to know that at closure, we're gonna have landscapes that look like this. The thing that's important to understand is that mining takes time. A tailings pond can be in operation for up to 30 years, so there are things that um, we cannot reclaim right away because they are uh, actively being used. The best part of my job is working with the operators yeah, and, and seeing how they progress and seeing how we can work together to make things better. Our operations and development opportunities are located on traditional lands and we realize that we need to uh, support the development and uh, the mutual respect and understanding between our, our Aboriginal partners. Approximately 13% of our, our workers are, uh, are First Nations. Uh, our contractors also have similar levels of employment in their workforce and we encourage that with all of the, the contractors that work with us. Pimi is the closest thing to oil or grease in Crete. Pimi was started in 1984, a brainchild of Imperial Oil and six chiefs that were, were the, the founding fathers of the company. The heavy oil has pr provided about 80 jobs. Several of the longer term employees have, have sons working for us now. Having a successful First Nations company has helped the communities. Some of our employees create great role models for the kids coming up through school. The kids can come and work for you know, Imperial or Synovus, or they can come and work for PIMI or some of the other First Nations companies. 
We have an Imperial native network that has been developed. It was developed some years ago, which is a number of Aboriginal employees that we have that, that go out into the community and encourage uh, roles and jobs in the oil and gas industry. They do things such as uh, attending science fairs, doing speeches in, in classrooms, and just getting involved with the young people out there to, to let them know that there is a, a future for them in this industry. We're a very successful company and we pay dividends to the First Nations every year and, and they use that for, for infrastructure and to, to help with training and, and uh, all sorts of things. You know, there are some other First Nations in the province that have looked at the PIMI model and if there's some interest in, in us uh, going to help them do exactly what PIMI is doing in this area. In Cold Lake we've implemented a native internship program. Uh, that native internship program uh, has an on-the-job training component where we, we bring Aboriginal folks who are interested in a career in operations uh, and we pay for their on-the-job training and, uh, and provide that development for them on site. Imperial Hall has a number of different development plans in place for the future and Aboriginal workforce is a key part of that, uh, that development.